Hi, the topic of our lecture today is identity in adolescence. And identity has a place of honor in uh, the adolescent literature ever since Eric Erickson spoke about that in his uh, books about adolescence. He's a very influential psychologist and he named identity as being the great developmental task of adolescence. And identity, when we talk about that, we talk about a complete sense of self, uh, something that is goal-oriented, that a person uh, knows who he is or who she is and has a grasp of how they are in relationships and what their role is in society. Uh, so it's a very uh, important concept in general. And in Western society these days, this is especially important. So every adolescent has to define him or herself and understand where they fit in, uh, in society. Uh, so uh, from childhood to adolescence, uh, uh, there's, a, there's a development in the, in the kid's sense of self, uh, which begins with something more concrete. Uh, when you talk to younger kids, they, they'll talk a lot about the way they look. And as time goes on, it becomes more essential and more uh, defining themselves in relation to others and in and how they are and social relations and, and so on. And um, Erickson uh, spoke about different aspects of identity and uh, one aspect has to do with gender roles. So here we, we have to uh, uh, know some terms. So first of all, we have the sex, which is biologically determined. Even that is not absolutely clear. But uh, when we talk generally about sex, we're talking about uh, the genetics of a person, whether they're, uh, they have uh, the sex uh, chromosomes XX or XY. These are the definitions and, of course, the genitalia and the body structures and so on that uh, is connected to these uh, Chromosomes, the, as I said, even that is no is no guarantee for an absolute uh, uh, difference between the sexes in all sorts of extreme cases. But this is usually a pretty good uh, uh, place to start. And then, uh, from the biologically determined sex, um, uh, stem the gender roles. So gender roles is what society tells us that uh, you're supposed that one is supposed to be within society, uh, the sort of uh, attributes, characteristics of male, males versus females, and so on. And uh, we know that kids they uh, they comprehend these gender roles very early on. Uh, so when you talk to someone who's about four or five years old, they already have quite a good representation of what uh, what a man is and what a uh, what a woman is and they know what they are they know that whether they're boys or girls and they know exactly um, what that means they, they have gender constancy which means that they know they'll they won't change they won't become a girl if they're a boy or, or vice versa and they have already gender stereotypes at a very a very early age so in order to demonstrate that I'll show you a, a little video uh, that where kids are interviewed, kids who are four or five years old, uh, about gender roles. Children have a strong sense of gender identity and gender role expectations. Most two-year-olds know with certainty whether they are male or female, and by the age of four or five begin not only to develop gender constancy, but often show rigid standards for what they believe is appropriate male and female dress and behavior. Can boys put on dresses? Do girls have short hair or long hair? Long hair. Are you a boy or a girl? A boy. <laughs> are you ever going to be a girl? No. What are boys like? Oh, I don't know. Are they different than girls? How are they different than girls? Because they don't put stuff like girls on. Boys don't put on girls' clothes? No. Can girls put on boys' clothes? No. Alexis, are you a boy or a girl? A girl. Are you ever going to be a boy? Uh-uh. Are you a boy or a girl? Boy. 
Are you ever going to be a girl? No. Boys are better than girls. Why? Because boys are stronger than girls sometimes. What would happen if you put on a dress? All the girls and all the boys would laugh at me. So we look like a boy that we look like a girl. Would it be okay? No way. Young children appear to begin to acquire gender role stereotypes at about the same time that they develop gender identity. And by the age of three or four, most children, when asked questions about the activities appropriate for a male doll and a female doll, readily give stereotypic responses. Which doll likes to clean the house? This one. Who takes care of the babies? What? <laughs> this one. Who goes to work? <laughs> this one. So uh, you can see that from a very early age, uh, kids have an understanding of uh, what it is to be a girl and what it is to be a boy and what are the gender roles that are associated with that. And uh, in addition, uh, there is uh, within society, of course, uh, uh, different pressures so that in general, uh, every person has a more feminine or in a more masculine uh, part uh, to themselves. and uh, and. And we know that from research, for example, men who are very uh, manly and women who are what they call androgynous, so they have more, so let's say, connection with their more masculine parts, uh, show a greater uh, quality of life and greater uh, satisfaction. Um, so, uh, so this is about gender, and another term that is important to remember is sexual orientation. Sexual orientation is the preference when it comes to uh, sex, when it comes to romantic and intimate contact, and uh, and this has uh, no correlation with uh, the gender identity. So, whether you see yourself more as a man or more as a woman. And then, as I said, every person has both these components within their personality. It has no correlation to your sexual orientation. So you can consider yourself very manly and at the same time very masculine, and at the same time be attracted to men and, and so on and so forth. So gender identity is all about how you perceive yourself and yourself. And, and gender identity is closely connected to the gender stereotypes because there are a set, there are, there is a set of traits that is connected to a gender. So, for example, men are usually considered more assertive, more ambitious, more uh, competitive, and so on, while women are considered more, uh, uh, with better, a, better able to, to care for other people, being more collectively minded, so minded to the whole family and the, and the tribe and so on, while men are very individualistic. And in that sense, um, when you consider yourself a uh, man or uh, masculine or feminine, you uh, are connecting with these stereotypes to a certain extent. So one of the students uh, Erickson had that who was very influential was a psychologist uh, by the name of John Marcia, who had his uh, PhD thesis become uh, very, very influential. And uh, he basically looked at identity as uh, some sort of cross between two main uh, uh, tasks. So on the one hand, uh, one task is to actively search and explore and see if there are um, different identities, different uh, uh, tasks that may uh, fit your, your, your personality. And the other task is about commitment. So uh, whether you've gone through a period of exploration or not, are you committed to any kind of uh, identity, any kind of uh, role that you take, whether it's vocationally or uh, re in relations or 
uh, gender roles and, and so on and so forth. So the, the, uh, the way that he built these two tasks uh, forms four identity statuses. Identity diffusion, identity foreclosure, identity moratorium, and identity achievement. And we're going to talk a little about each one. So identity diffusion is basically when the adolescent, and by the way, this can be relevant to also adults and, and so on, um, whether the person went through a period of exploration. Uh, so in identity diffusion, the person has not gone through a period of exploration and has not made any commitment. Uh, so uh, in the website, you can see uh, a funny, I think it's funny, a funny clip that I put there uh, that describes a character from uh, a Tarantino movie. His name is Floyd, and I see him as the archetype for identity diffusion, so I hope you'll find it funny. And uh, identity foreclosure means that the person has not gone through exploration, but uh, is committed to a certain uh, role, a certain uh, goal or so on. So for example, we can have uh, a person who is thinking about uh, a career. He's not sure what he wants to do. He's uh, right now uh, in some sort of uh, limbo. And then, for example, there's a crisis in the family and he's told, you've got to save the family. You've got to take on the family business. And, you know, 30 years later, he's still there. So a person like that it would be prototypical of identity foreclosure. So taking on uh, a role without going through the exploration that, uh, that is required. Identity moratorium is someone who is in exploration but makes no commitments. So uh, this is very famous in Israeli society for people who are... Um, um, taking the big trip after the, uh, their military service, you know, going to the Far East, going to South America, trying drugs, uh, exploring different cultures, exploring different philosophies, uh, and thinking, you know, what, what do they want to do in life without making any commitment. So this is about moratorium. So this is about not making any commitment yet, but, you know, the only commitment is a commitment to exploration. I still want to find out uh, what I want to do in my life. And identity achievement is the pinnacle of this whole process, meaning that someone has gone through a serious period of uh, exploration, and after that, after an identity crisis, has made a commitment to some sort of uh, identity. That would be the, um, the optimal uh, way to go about it according to Marcia and Erickson. Um, so that will be it for um, identity and uh, I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.